Good morning to one and all present here. Welcome back to the day two international virtual conference on recent advances in biochemical and material sciences 2020. Prayer does not change God, but it changes him who prays. Let us start the day with a prayer song by our college choir. Thank you, Coyer. I would like to call Dr. Prabhagaran Sir, Head, Department of Physics, to introduce the guest speaker of the session 5, Mr. Vail Murugan N. Ramachandran Sir. Over to Prabhagaran Sir. Good morning, everyone. Myself, Dr. M. Prabhagaran, HOD of Physics Department. Feeling delighted to be a part of this program on behalf of the college management principal, faculty members, students, I take great pleasure to extend a warm welcome to our research person and guest speaker of the session, Mr. Velmurgan N. Ramachandra. I would like to present an introduction about our speaker. Velmurgan N. Ramachandra is a visionary leader and an entrepreneur with 20 years of progressive experience in managing complex engineering and software organization for life sciences, particularly medical devices, health care and pharmaceuticals. He has deep passion and wealth of understanding in core medical physics, digital elect electronics, instrumentation, and computer softwares. He has led many product development and research initiative in device connectivity, digital health, connected health, and robotic space. His focus is on innovation, utilizing various imaging technologies, sensors that uses laser, IR, ultrasonics combining with software technologies like Internet of Things, Artificial Intelligence, and Machine Learning. He currently serves as Vice President of Engineering R&D in AMP Medtech, where he focuses on core digital technologies for smart medical devices and robotic products. And his academics, he completed UG degree in Physics from Department of Physics Presidency College, Chennai. And Master of Master degree in computer application from Department of Computer Science Engineering, Alapa University, Karaikudi, Tamil Nadu, and India. And he has completed graduate level course coursework in managerial accounting and HR management from Harvard Extension School, Harvard University, Massachusetts, USA. So remainder to the participants, you can post your comments and questions in the chat box. Okay, now I request Mr. Vail Murugan and Ramachandra to take over the session. Sir, please. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for the war warm welcome and uh, invitation for me to talk in um, this prestigious occasion. Um, and thanks to um, Dr. Parmala and uh, Dr. M. Prabhagaran for inviting me here. Um, without further ado, Let's get started with the session. Today, I'm gonna to talk about digital advancements in biomedical devices. Let me share the screen.
So hope everyone can see the screen. Yes. Good. Um, okay. So our agenda is going to be, you know, yeah, high level on maxi to millimeter size pulse oximeter. Um, I'm going to start with that. Uh, there is a reason for that. And um, we are going to touch upon a little bit on the AI and digital advancements. And we are going to dive deeper into sensor technologies. Um, and I'm going to end with where the future is heading towards. Um, just to give you a background, um, my focus is more around implementation of these technologies. I come from engineering side. Um, I know a lot of our prior speakers uh, focus more on the scientific research side uh, and the academic side. Here you will see and hear a lot more about you know, the practical difficulties of all the researches we do and all the science um, that we discover and how we make it uh, more usable and more um, applicable to the actual relevant problems that we face today, right? I wanna start this whole session with the quote, necessity is the mother of invention. Every invention that we see um, stemmed from a lot of discoveries in the research time that we put in, but that is stemmed really from the necessity. The need is what created that interest. And um, that interest, you can see every day, you know, like when you are walking around, if you want to buy something or if you want, if you want to have something, right, that's when you notice that most. So, for example, if you want to buy a Honda car and um, when you go on the road, all you see is Honda cars because there is a need for you that you started seeing that. Whatever, you know, like uh, when the need comes, everything becomes automatically visible. Now, in this world, current world, we are in a virtual world because of a reason, uh, COVID, COVID-19. You know, everywhere you see, you know, we have an issue, we have a pandemic, you know, uh, everybody is trying to solve that um, with everything that they know. One of the things that, you know, like we need is vaccine uh, and we need PPEs, we need disinfectants, we need testing equipments, we need um, recovery methods and therapies to cure the infection. Uh, we need antiviral drugs, um, we need steroids. So there is so many things that we need. And when you look at it, you know, like uh, um, the devices that we use in curing uh, or identifying um, is ventilators and the pulse oximeters, which has been around for, you know, like God knows, you know, 40, 50 years now. Um, but we are still trying to uh, come to a situation where that can be produced quickly in a fashion that will um, that will help our situation today, right? With that, I'll move into the journey of pulse oximeter that we know of, meaning, you know, within our generation know of and where it is today. Um, most of you know pulse oximeter is a device that measures the oxygen saturation in the blood. Now, why do you want to measure, right, um, oxygen? The lung is the one which takes the um, oxygen from the air that we breathe in and try to put it through the blood, through the hemoglobin and sends to the entire body so the cells can do its function, right? So when the lungs loses its capacity or when there is issue in the lungs, automatically your oxygen saturation level goes down. And to find out, you know, like a, how the oxygen saturation exists and how much it goes down, we use pulse oximeter. So the early stage pulse oximeter that you see on the left hand side where I'm showing the mouse, which is a bulky device, it does only one function, which basically reads the oxygen saturation on a um, person's blood using optical sensors. You know, there is an IR emitter and a, a receiver, which basically senses the blood oxygen level. And its ge next generation came in with advanced graphing methods and integrated electronics. Then it become into a form, a smaller form factor where, you know, like a, it becomes a pocket or handheld more transport ready. The modern day within last 10 years, these uh, not even 10 years, like, like four or five years, 
there is no separate device there is no you know wires attached the sensor itself is more like a this this possible format where you know all the electronic circuitry and the sensors are fully embedded in a finger probe itself now one level up that finger probe now can connect wirelessly to your mobile device or any you know like a central uh, uh, data collection mechanism where you can chart out all the details and um, use it for further studies and further analytics. Now, to go into further, that sensor now made it in a millimeter scale where that can be mounted on a fingernail. How all these possible? It's because of our, our technology advancements that's been happening um, in the electronics, in the material science, in the um, manufacturing of all these things. So where, where the digital helps here, making all these communicate to each other, all these components to shrink together and work together, even though we have, you know, we, we invented so many, uh, we discovered so many uh, materials that can do wonders, but taking that data and processing it and sending it and making it as a usable information, that's when, you know, the whole digital part comes in the communication mode and how we transmit the data wirelessly and how we harvest the data and how we show it on a screen or how we give it to the patient or the doctor so they can make a decision and action, right? This is all enabled by the digital technologies. So, and I, I just want to dive deeper a little bit on this miniature wearable pulse oximetry, which is five millimeter in total size, which can be mounted on a uh, fingernail or, you know, like a, your earlobe or anything. The key thing here is um, the scale is one, definitely. But when you reduce the scale, how will you include a power source, like a battery, right? How will you include a transmitter? You know, um, how will you include a sensor in that small millimeter scale? That's you know, that's where the, you know, like the, um, the innovation excites us. So um, the researchers found out, um, yeah, um, the NFC has been around for long, um, for probably 10 years now. Um, the RF, RFID or RFC, uh, RFID technology is the one led to the NFC technology. And with the NFC and with, um, with the wireless charging and converting the microwaves into an energy source led to this in, uh, innovation where two copper coils um, sandwiched between polyamides, um, which can take this, uh, the um, microwaves as a source uh, to generate the energy or, you know, like to take the radio energy and convert it into a uh, energy source. And that energy source that can power the entire sensor itself. So in the, in the diagram B here, if you look at it, um, the wireless signal itself, the radio transmitter trans receiver on this NFC chip itself um, used for dual purposes. One is for communication and the other is also for power generation. So that power, harvested power is the one powers the entire microcontroller and the sensor itself. Here, if you look at it, the sensor is yeah, an LED and an LED trans receiver. So this, this simple block diagram explains you how they were able to achieve um, this powerful uh, sensor, uh, not just sensor, the powerful entire solution, right? Uh, for the wearable pulse oximetry in a five millimeter form factor. That's really interesting. So now, okay, uh, let me go back a little bit. So with all, with all these inventions, right, we are getting so much of data. Now, okay, um, we found a chip that is so small, but how one will read that data and how that data will be you know, visible to a doctor or a patient in this case, right? So that's where the digital technology comes in and where, where the, um, uh, the data is being harvested by a nearby microcontroller or some, uh, some kind of a mobile device, 
which can chart out the data and show a vital information graph where doctor or or another device or another algorithm or maybe a ai uh, um, um, computer program that can make an action um, on the next therapeutic execution right so for example based on this um, we need to make an adjustment on a ventilator for example the oxygen level goes down so now we need to uh, change the settings on the ventilator that is sitting nearby, helping the patient with uh, assisting their lung uh, can be controlled if need be. So those are all the implementation that is being researched on and happening currently. So to help, um, I want to touch upon a little bit. Okay, so now uh, I'm going into a lot of computers, but even though, you know, like a, I... I intentionally wanted to stay away from computers and I don't, you know, based on the um, topic of the session, um, the computers, the theories that we use in the computers and how we analyze this data is nothing new to physics. Um, this is nothing but a computer, uh, computational physics and the, um, that where um, a lot of, you know, that Monte Carlo methods, which is basically the, uh, analysis of randomness and uh, creating a deterministic view on a chaos where basically what it means is you know like a Monte Carlo uh, method uh, did a lot of uh, different models and methods and techniques used to identify some kind of a pattern on a chaos um, if the data is very random and if the data is very erratic um, where you can use um, uh, regression methods and the you know Statistical, statistical methods to cluster the data and create a pattern and make sense out of those, right? Uh, with those increase in focus, um, we are using even the, you know, like a minimalistic sensor, which uh, with a lot of errors, with a lot of um, imperfections, we can make a usable sense. So, when it is combined with right uh, algorithm, we can even learn and learn and identify what data set is useful and what data set is not useful. What is a false positive and what is a false negative? Um, so that the system can pick up what is needed for that application process. So, um, and when these data is connected with the embedded processor or sent through a um, cloud environment where these data can be used and form a nice visualizations or actionable insights, which could help us to solve many real world problems, which we will see in coming slides. So one of such things is, you know, like uh, advancements in medical imaging. So we have these sensors. I'm, I'm switching gears in, from a simple sensor to a complex um, imaging where, you know, whether you are using an X-ray or a, a MRI or a, um, X-ray or MRI, uh, we have complex images, uh, tissue images that is taken out and um, those images are um, very high resolution. Uh, those images are very, um, let me put it this way. Um, it, it has multiple structures. It is hard to analyze. And um, AI has proven that um, it can analyze very successfully um using deep learning or semantic computing or neural networks these techniques are start to mimic human-like processes when we say human-like processes it is almost like how human humans think in their minds it is it is not like a pure mathematical model where we used to use if then else rather it is more of a pattern matching uh, and a selection and negation process um, so in case of medical imaging, there is a lot of advancements that has happened where we use today, you know, like a 3D imaging from a computer generated 3D imaging from a low radiation 2D images, 
using um, a technique called homosynthesis, which is basically, you know, like a generating a 3D image based on a multiple slices of um, 2D images. And the computer vision is another seg uh, segment where uh, combined with the AI enabled technologies, uh, these images can be analyzed by the computers um, that can deduct even the malignancies that cannot be seen through visible eyes. Some of these images is, are highly, you know, um, 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 highly zoomed in where we take it with very high resolution cameras. Um, still, you know, the cells and the, you know, tissues or the, you know, calcifications is very hard to notice by the uh, human eyes. Where if you look at, you know, like a, from a 2D image, um, the, the, uh, the segment that you can't see here with a 3D image, you can visually identify uh, with the greater precision. Um, and the same technique can be used for classifying good cells versus bad cells. And that helps in a lot of, of um, new methodologies on cancer reduction, whether it is a pathology side, slide or whether it is a mammogram x-ray. Uh, the AI can help us to, um, help us to identify, um, classify, and um, sort out the uh, anomalies that we see on those images. With that, um, probably I'll move on to the uh, modern day sensor technologies. Um, we are in the era of uh, digitalization, where nanomaterials are used as sensors that can transfer vital signals, which we saw earlier, right? Um, in that case, you know, it was not a nanomaterial, rather it was a, um, it was a LED and an uh, optical receiver, um, but we, uh, we see, um, carbon-based nanomaterials are uh, used widely on the sensors uh, that we will see um, in coming flights um, where um, a nearby microprocessor that analyzes the sensor data that comes from those sensors and it sends to a AI service that is on a cloud and now the whole process completes, um, the data collection completes now the AI cloud service could send an action back to the device saying, okay, do this or send an electrical signal or create an electrical impulse. That's how the whole solution is being implemented in today's medical device applications. Um, in, um, and these kind of advancements um, are possible because we have made so much progress on the electronics where the uh, the packaging of electronic um, wafers uh, or the chipsets in a micro scale is doable today. There is technology exists uh, to create, you know, like um, um, wafer level packaging or CSP, the uh, uh, chip scale packaging, or exists today that where you you can make chips which is a nanometer size, or you can make chips um, that is, you know, like a millimeter size that can be embeddable. Um, the optics technology has increased that the entire optical package can be implemented on a SMD chip. Um, so, you know, we remember the days, you know, like uh, there is convex lens and concave lenses so that you put it in the focal points and all, right? And then, you know, there is a, a light source and there is a um, um, film or a um, sensor that captures today, all those mechanisms can be captured in a single package um, with a yeah, nearby computing power, you know, your powerful microprocessor, everything together package in a single package that is mounted in your normal cameras and uh, even more powerful, you know, like in a small capsule that can be swallowed inside. Um, and the material science has improved uh, that, you know, like improved in the sense that there is so many new inventions uh, that we see in a later um, slide where um, uh, certain deductions, even at a very micro voltage ranges, uh, is deduct uh, deduction is possible. And a yeah, complicated polymer based uh, uh, batteries are possible to power these uh, devices. So now sensors are more reliable. Um, uh, highly sensitive, smaller in size, uh, and combining all these with the 
computer technologies that we have coupled with AI and ML, you know, we can do wonders in medical device. And when, 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 you know, like all these research and science becomes a usable product, you know, it has to go through this commercial viability. A lot of things, you know, like uh, um, still sits in the lab because, you know, uh, to implement into certain formats or form factors is not possible yet. Um, you're still working on the technologies, how to pack these or how to, you know, um, make it viable in a hospital setting or make it viable in a user setting. Um, um, this, um, um, we are going to uh, see some of the key areas um, that is considered before a technology becomes implementable and make it commercially viable. One is obviously, you know, like a um, um, biomedical devices by the name, you know, like it has to be in a hospital setting or be with the patient or be on the body of the patient, right? So the overall size uh, is um, plays a big role there. So with advanced microscale packaging technologies that we I spoke about before, um, the nanometer scale um, chips are possible with uh, complicated uh, electronic circuitry that you can package it in, you know, very teeny scale um, and put it into a um, fully functional capsule and sent through the body, right? Um, and then, you know, we we saw in the we saw in the um, uh, small scale pulse oximetry um, where you know how the the power source to power all these sensors, how much vital it is. Um, you know, um, that is a key consideration, you know, to make a product uh, commercially viable. So, I hear some noise. You can mute. Okay. Um, so, um, Okay, um, so low energy consumption is a key, right? You know, so you cannot have a medical device, you know, that fails or, you know, like it runs out of a battery in the middle of a process, right? Uh, so having a um, power management or low energy consumption is a key uh, to pick a sensor technology um, that is used for medical grade devices. Um, the next key important point is, you know, like a reliable communication. So all these sensors collect vital data from your body or you know the environment that is in. Uh, some of them inside your body, some of them outside your body, um, and it, it keeps on collecting vital information. That vital information needs to be sent uh, to be processed um, or to be you know like used by the you know um, the user. In in some cases it is patient, in some cases it's a doctor, in some cases it's another system or another device that uses that data to make an action, right? So um, reliable communication, you know, in most of these, we use by either, you know, like a um, storage based data communication where, you know, the data is stored until it is accessed. Um, then, you know, in some cases we use wireless radio and wireless radio technology has came long way from the days, you know, like a, we, we need to have like a 20 foot antenna in your house uh, to even receive a radio signal, right? Today, the radio signals are so much, um, we have technologies um, that we can communicate locally in a smaller range with a powerful fidelity. And, and, you know, far, far away through satellite communications where we can, you know, communicate um, without loss of signal, right? So in, in most of our examples that we will see uh, from here on is, uh, mostly around Bluetooth. Bluetooth is for a long range and a huge data um, volume or a large data sets. And uh, BLE, um, which is a Bluetooth low energy, which is uh, basically for a short range uh, for a smaller data packet sizes. You know, like a, if the data uh, volume is small or, you know, if you're collecting a few sets of parameters, you know, Bluetooth low energy is a best option because the energy consumptions towards BLE is um very very less and nfc nfc is you know like almost like powerless right you know so you you can have nfc where you don't really need to have a um high powered radio package um built in you know the the nfc um handler um 
itself can handle, you know, transfer of the signals. Um, so another biggest thing is, you know, like if we are creating all these complicated, you know, uh, electronic circuitry that communicates with each other, um, you know, having a battery and having a, a chemical components, the safety and security of these devices is very, very important. You know, the safety from, you know, all the chemicals or all the components that goes into these packages and also the security of the devices in terms of how it communicates. You cannot employ a pacemaker that is you know, hackable from outside where you know, your neighbor is gonna have the control of when you will die, right? So that is key important thing when we design these packages. So now um, let me switch gears on where, you know, like with all of these in mind, you know, like where the technology is going towards, where are we today? And um, um, one of the one of the um, greatest um, um, inventions in material science is um, the biodegradable um, uh, electronic circuitries, or you know, like a, um, in other words, uh, resorbable you know um, chemical compounds, which um, which can be used to, to create. Um, electronic circuits. Um, so there is a lot of research going on um, um, using those components and using those um, uh, electronic uh, sensors um, help identify the uh, brain function, how the brain uh, stimulate happens, um, and when uh, when there is a neurologic uh, neurological disorders, how we can you know identify those and help to make um, either you know cognitive functions to work or you know like a suppressor stroke. Uh, there is a lot of things going on in that area. Uh, today, you know, like um, we have sensors that sits outside the body and sends a signal inside the brain um, to through a connected tethered wire to send the electrical pulse, you know, for, you know, brain, uh, the epilepsies or the stroke that happens in the brain, right? Um, but the, these um, can be transformed um, where it is more like a um, implantable device um, using these sensors. And uh, um, there's a couple of in, uh, innovations that uh, interested me very much is the, uh, in this area is neural, one of them is neural dust uh, by Michael Marbis, uh, co-author uh, from, he's the co-author. Um, this is um, yeah, it's a research project from uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, this was, I think if I, am, if I remember right, the paper came out in 2016, um, where, where they invented a, a small circuitry, um, which contains a transistor and a piece of crystal and encapsulated in a polymer, um, which is biocompatible, obviously, um, which which doesn't need power from outside. The ultrasound of the pizza itself will generate its own power uh, that can um, power the entire sensor and um, it can record um, everything that happens around the, um, around the, um, the sensor, you know, um, so whether it is an electrical signal um, or movements, it can, it can record those. So this is a game changer in this um, because this is the, the scale of this is, you know, um, is like a sand size. It's like one millimeter cube in total uh, where this can be, you know, like injected or um, uh, taken, you know, like a, through intravenous. Uh, or you know implanted and um, because this is totally biocompatible there is no you know issue of rejection and this will opens up uh, opportunity for you know creating the entire telemetry of our body function um, so the the other interesting um, um, discovery is you know fully bio um, degradable or fully absorbable resorb re Reserve, uh, reabsorbable um, chip, uh, sensor chip uh, that can be implanted in brain. So if, if, if somebody goes through a um, brain surgery or if they have a ne uh, neurological disorder, 
today, you know, like uh, we keep sensors inside and, you know, like study them and take the sensor out once everything is cured or whatever, right? So this, you know, like you can implant it and use it for your purpose. And um, once, you know, like um, after the time that, you know, like you wanted to study, uh, you don't need to really take it out because this can be totally absorbed by the body, by the body's natural metabolism. Um, which means, um, so whether it is electrolysis or, you know, like uh, through ad adsorption, through absorption, the materials um, that is used in making this chip uh, can be dissolved um, by our natural um, body function, um, natural metabolic functions. So with that, I'll switch gears in terms of, you know, okay, um, what is wearables and, uh, you know, where we are in the wearables world and uh, why, you know, we see, you know, like a big burst of wearables in today's market or, you know, like a, everybody has some kind of wearable, you know, like a, you have Fitbit, you have smartwatch, you know, like a, even for example, you have a phone, you know, that detects your body, body movements, you know, like a, uh, it detects your, you know, activity um, in what and all possible, you know, using those, right? See, uh, uh, from the beginning to now, if you look at it, the trend is, you know, like most of these sensors or most of these, you know, um, most of these um, medical device are, uh, is, has shrunken in its form factor, you know, a lot uh, so that it is, it is easily, you know, like uh, mobile and, you know, yeah, the, the power consumption has gone down, the size has gone down, uh, it can be put in, in a smaller package. Those are the reasons why wearables is coming out more and more. And uh, today, if you look at it, we have chronic problems um, in the developed world as well as developing world. For example, diabetes, obesity, these are all you know, chronic problems where the wearables industry is trying to make use of, um, make, uh, help the you know, situation um, by creating a novel therapies around, okay, how to make you active, how to detect your um, um, insulin variations, you know, uh, or how to, you know, help um, control your uh, blood pressure. So these are all some small, you know, simple examples how these, uh, in, in conjunctions with the wearables, uh, in conjunctions with the, you know, smart softwares and AI, um, we are trying to make use of these technologies together to solve uh, chronic illnesses that we see in today's uh, social environment. So uh, some of those examples are, you know, are the uh, con um, CGMs, which is continuous glucose monitors. Basically, it, it, it's a device that monitors um, your glu glucose level in your uh, blood. Uh, it is a device that you put it on, you know, and, and it has a small, um, probe that senses you know your glucose level and this can be linked to a insulin delivery pump which is a, another pump which is uh, uh, attached to a subcutaneous membrane of your body where you know it can deliver uh, artificial insulin or synthetic insulin uh, into your body you know based on your insulin levels that was read by the cgm um, obviously you know like a lot of you would have seen the um, uh, smart watches that can sense your, you know, pulse rate, um, the um, temperature, and when are you sleeping, when are you awake, when are you overactive, you know, when are you doing cardio, all those are made possible from a single sensor or, you know, like, a, or multiple sensors, like an EKG sensor or a um, pulse sensor, and put on a software on top of it uh, to come up with, you know, your mode of activity. Uh, that is the intelligence built on top of it, um, the sensor data that we get out of those sensors. So um, with, um, with wearables, I'll switch gears towards, you know, wireless devices and implantable devices, which is a mainstream medical device. Uh, so even though the, the, the prior ones that we spoke about, you know, even though it treats the chronic illnesses, it is more like a consumer focused uh, uh, consumer devices. The devices that we are going to see now is more um, medical grade implantable devices that sits inside your body. Um, we spoke about the brain, um, deep brain neurosimulator, which helps to you know control seizures in brain. 
um, which which is what we you know we saw about the neural um, um, neural dust and uh, the other implantable sensor that is um, bioabsorbable. Um, this was uh, probably an earlier version where this device is implanted inside a wire comes out and where you know like it can be programmed from outside wirelessly. The other one that you know like uh, probably a lot of um, the folks might have seen is the um, the cochlear implant is a small electronic device that electronically simulates the hearing nerve that's you know basically a device that goes around the ear sitting outside and there is a probe that is connected uh, which basically sim simulates um, stimulates um, when there is a hearing issues um, then this is uh, a gastric uh, GES, which is a gastric electric simulator, which is implantable, um, um, used for you know like people who have uh, very nauseating conditions. You know, like it stimulates the you know um, you know and suppresses those, and it is also used for weight control. Um, we we spoke about implantable insulin pump, the, uh, the insulin pump that fitted outside as a wearable, and this one is a pump that is fitted inside basically the delivery mechanism of the insulin itself you know is inside and uh, it is tethered through a pipe um, uh, or a capillary where you know the outside insulin is pumped through through the tether and delivered subcutaneously or you know under the tissue um, the other one is foot drop implant which is basically you know helps for people who have dragging legs where they could not lift the leg at right time, so their legs will drag. This foot drop impl implant basically stimulates, uh, you know, like and helps them to lift, a, you know, like initiate that lifting action so that their foot will not drag anymore. And, you know, and, and there's various other sensors that I did not touch upon. Um, you know, we have a very short time and um, definitely there is a lot more interesting sensors. Um, um, here, this uh, the um, the knee sensor, which is also called a um, ortho pressure sensor, um, basically used for uh, understanding how much pressure you put on a knee, um, or you know how much pressure is, or you know various parameters around you know like uh, how to stabilize your knee, um, you know post your uh, knee surgery, or you know like when you have some kind of arthritis condition where your kneecap or uh, the bone around knee is eroded. So all these devices, uh, when you look at it, you know, uh, it is all possible um, because we have various digital technologies where it, it communicates uh, from an outside device or, you know, like a, come, a sec, harvest some kind of data, sends it outside, um, and uh, that is used and processed to create a, um, therapeutic action. So this is another area that's been, you know, like um, in vivo capsules is another area, uh, you know, like a, a package type of uh, sensor capsules uh, is gaining a lot of momentum in recent years where um, um, people might have known, seen, you know, like those uh, endoscopies and um, um, various methods of, you know, contrast agents and, uh, uh, drinkable um, uh, contra uh, um, uh, drinkable um, materials where you use to identify you know um, certain um, abnormalities in the GI tract or stomach or you know some tumors or um, uh, or uh, ulcers uh, uh, to identify those you know like or you know in, in general any abnormalities in the GI tract. Um, we used to do, you know, like extensive preparation and do, you know, either a radiology X-ray or do a endoscopy, which is a tethered application. Um, uh, we have um, more and more sensors um, in a capsule format. Um, in in a ca capsule format, uh, where it can do different different functions. We have LED, LED based spectrometers, which which can analyze. Um, there is a small window in this uh, capsule, essentially, you know, the, the chemical compound or the, ju the juice inside the body um, can go in where it can analyze um, through, the, um, uh, through the spectrum analyzer um, from the light, uh, light source emitted by the LED and records those information and sends out 
so that we know what is happening inside. Uh, color sensing capsule is another, um, basically it is, um, uh, it is a TFT module which sensor, it, it's almost like a camera module, um, but it can sense different colors uh, when, you know, when it is combined with um, uh, color contrasting a, um, chemicals, you know, it, it can highlight certain areas of the tissues or certain, you know, uh, elements around the um, um, path um, where we can study and identify what is going on there. Um, so um, the electrochemical sensing capsule is another one, you know, uh, it, it can, you know, find out the electric, electrochemical properties. Um, so optical coherence, uh, coherence tomography is, it's a tethered application, it's an OCT capsule, essentially, you know, like um, uh, it is connected to a uh, um, sensing and uh, um, light source uh, outside, it's almost like a, a swallowable endoscope. And obviously ultrasonic imaging, uh, it is similar to uh, the regular ultrasonic, except that, you know, it can reach to the areas where typically we may not be able to reach from outside the body. So with all those, let me, you know, like uh, give a summary of where the future is heading with all these sensor technologies and with all the technologies that we have in hand. Um, um, the, the future key areas um, is heavily focused today are, you know, the flexible and transient electronics, uh, which basically talks about, you know, all these uh, flexible um, nanomaterials and the uh, polymers that's uh, conducting polymers that is being created is used for creating sensors that can be put on as a skin patch or can be put on uh, implanted inside a tissue where you know you don't need to worry too much about you know flexing it or you know the stresses of those will not cause issues in terms of what data it collects or what data it transmits or it's in a in an overall function right um, it, and for example you know the advanced um, um, nanomaterial science um, sorry uh, the advancements in nanomaterial science and nanomaterials um, um, it helps in creating, you know, some of the bioabsorbable or biodegradable or bioresorbable uh, electronic systems, uh, which you see on the right side, where it is encapsulated on a um, on a um, um, bi um, biodegradable polymer that is biocompatible. Um, the entire circuitry can be dissolved and disappeared once its functional use is no longer needed. Um, so um, in, in this area, nanosilicon is one key thing that, um, again, nano, uh, uh, nano, some of the nanosilicon uh, co combinations are totally bioabsorbable. Um, so that's, uh, that's another thing, you know, like is used um, uh, to create uh, some of the um, devices, um, the, the implantable devices um, in this area. Um, the another important area the future, uh, the, there is a lot of research going on is the energy harvesting devices. So uh, on the right, you are seeing, uh, which, which we saw on the um, uh, millimeter scale uh, pulse oximetry uh, also is um, the device powers itself. Uh, that means it harvests the device, uh, 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 it harvests the energy in, in the components that it uses so that it can power the microcontrollers or the circuitry associated with it. Um, so the another area where you know the, there is a lot of uh, future research is uh, invested in is the um, the polymer-based battery technologies. Where you know, like for a for a medical grade device to be functional, we need to have um, consistent and reliable power source. Uh, with um, various uh, polymers uh, in the lithium-based polymers um, is used in longer lasting batteries and um, um, enhanced battery technologies where you know, the, the power sources can be more reliable. Um, and obviously, you know, uh, the embedded computing technologies where it, you know, the, the systems that can process this data and um, make it more usable, actionable, right near uh, where it is being captured. So not necessarily, you know, like a, you have, a, you know, 
um, multiple points of communication before it get it gets processed. With, you know, most of these packages have embedded my uh, microcontroller there itself, so that you know the raw signal is being processed there itself, and any you know. Um, um, any um, noise or any um, the abnormalities eliminated there itself. So um, I'll uh, with that I will. Uh, um, that's where our future is going. With that I'll end my session, and, and I just I, I want to extend my thanks to. Uh, and acknowledgements to all the program sponsors, organizers, and patrons, and special mentions for the following uh, folks, uh, uh, the chief patron, uh, Chevalier Dr. N.R. Danapalan, and the patrons, N.R. Prem Kumar, P.E.R. Premchand, Kamala Balakrishnan, and uh, Mrs. Uh, Jafia Salomon, uh, and also the conveners, Al Parmala, and uh, Mr. M. Um, Prabhagaran, and Dr. Chandra Mohan. I also want to extend my um, thanks to all the technical folks who worked underneath uh, to make this virtual conference a reality, you know, in these tough times. Um, this would have been more interesting to see, uh, do it in person, have a conversation and questions, um, but um, we will get into a virtual question answer. Um, um, if anyone has questions, um, Write your questions in the chat box, like Mr. Uh, Dr. Prabharan said. Uh, I'll try to answer to best of my abilities. If not, point to where you can find more information about it. Over to Mr. Prabharan. Okay, thank you, Elmarvan, sir, for your uh, nice presentation. We have received some questions uh, from faculties and uh, participants through YouTube chat box. The first question from uh, microbiology student from uh, our college. Uh, the question is, in future medical devices are smarter than today, how it is help for medical professional carriers? So um, when it comes to medical professional carriers, right? Um, the devices are not there to replace them, right? Uh, so one of the challenges that we phase in medical profession is um, the fatigue and the errors caused by uh, uh, misdiagnosis or you know uh, errors that is created because of technical issues. So a lot of the smartness that uh, we are building um, is focusing around how much accurate it is, how much we can eliminate the human errors how something can be uh, validated and verified information. So for example, I'll give you an, a small example. Today uh, in US, um, if you take an X-ray, right? It takes like uh, two hours for a radiologist to review it. And when you, uh, your tech takes the next ray and the X-ray is processed and sent to the central server and the radiologist takes it and reviews it, then the information is being released. The radiologist goes through so many of the images in a day that they keep swifting through information. So we are creating smartness to highlight within that image, okay, focus here. Okay, this is what, you know, the computer thinks uh, the issues are. Uh, the so essentially, you know, we are not eliminating the radiologist there. We are assisting the radiologist to be more accurate. So that's the step that we are doing. And also, if you look at you know, some of the things like, um, for example, pulse oximeter. If a nurse needs to keep on coming and uh, looking at a pulse oximeter for um, oxygen saturation level, it is not a good use of uh, her time, right? She could be attending a needed patient with care rather than you know, keep um, you know, making note of a reading. So when we make this smart technology where it can automatically chart out, automatically identify and create, uh, build the smartness within it, it helps, um, it helps the, um, uh, the nurse who is attending. So, so the smartness is being built to make these products more reliable. If I answer, you know, uh, hope that answers your question. Very good, sir. The uh, next question is from uh, Dr. Tananjay. 
how effective telemetry helps in the field of biomedical so telemetry is a very important thing until you don't know what it is you don't know so a lot of the discovery, discoveries we do today um is because we didn't do it, we didn't know it earlier as simple as that right um so even though i said necessity is the mother of invention until you go look at it you wouldn't know um so the key here is some of the telemetries that we are collecting is not exactly for today but for the future also because a lot of the issues that we look at today we don't know why it caused if you if you you know here to the lecture you know on the h pylori the other day you know we didn't know why you know is the h pylori is the cause for this like that we have so many uh, diseases and conditions we don't know how it came in the history of the telemetry helps to um chart it out and isolate the instances of things happening and come up with the perfect root cause when there is no telemetry available um it's hard to assess a situation so essentially telemetry is the one tells what is happening in your inside your body until then it's a uh, everybody's guess so a lot of our medical science if you see how it it gone through even till today right we don't know how everything happens when we are alive you know or before a issue happens um so that's why the telemetry is important where you can understand how a normal thing has to happen and when it becomes abnormal how it changes so now you have the baseline of a good and a bad so that you know like you can come up with a, a therapy to uh, address the problem you know, hope i answered your question yes, uh, yes. if you have any specific um, if you have any specific area you want me to focus you know like for example brain or you know uh, um, kidney function or liver function i can i can talk about a little bit more okay the next question is from first time as biochemistry students from our college what is the application of nanoparticles in biomedical technology there is lot of applications so uh, the 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 keynote speaker you know explained um devika um touched upon a lot of things on the nanoparticles um so i touched upon you know a lot of things um so the entire nano segment has lot of things um outside the medical device but within the medical device uh, in terms of implantables in terms of uh, drug carrier drug carrying or in terms of uh, uh, absorption into certain things it just comes under the um, drug delivery category um in the sensor category you know like um, um the nano silicon uh, is one other thing um and uh, some of the polymers uh, uh, the biopolymers based on nano um, nano uh, nano sized biopolymers used for creating packages and the um, implantable materials uh, are are very key in some of the modern inventions hope i answered your question okay 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 and uh... one of our faculty dr chandramohan achudi biochemistry raised their question uh, two questions they are asking first one is any validity lifetime period for uh, implanted devices yes so that is a very 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 good question so uh, some of the things that we touched upon is you know like uh, um how long a you know device can be reliable and how long a device can last right so for example pacemakers you know uh, that is implanted it has uh, uh, the battery inside so the battery is also part of the pacemaker itself and sitting inside uh, just above your chest um, um in the earlier days it was like a uh, 3 years now you know they are saying they can go up to 15 years so uh up until that point of time you know like uh, the device uh, can function properly it is designed to function properly and some of the devices that we are um, seeing being researched are being you know like uh, in the mode of creation is um that you don't need to really supply any battery power right so those devices can last the lifetime of the person 
um, in some of the sensors that we saw, uh, like the uh, ortho pressure sensors or the you know like uh, the sensor that is used for um, measuring the pressure um, or the weight or the balance of the knee or the you know, joint. Um, is used you know, until the design, you know, because every knee, uh, every joint replacement is custom designed. So until your knee is being designed and uh, calib manufactured, uh, um, you need those readings. So it is temporarily placed and taken out uh, once your new, new, uh, new custom knee is uh, manufactured. Okay. So, you know, uh, so to answer the question, um, each device has a different, uh, it designed to have a different um, uh, life expectancy. Life, okay, okay. Uh, his second question is, any specific nanomaterial is used for, which is used for glucometer? Any specific nanomaterial which is used for glucometer? So, um, the sensing um, of the actual glucose, uh, the um, so I think uh, you are referring to when you say glucometer, the the CGM device, the glucose monitor itself. Um, to my knowledge, it's more. Um, um, I think I have to refer back. Maybe you know, like uh, I'll give my email. I'll I'll I'll, you know, I'll check it on and I'll respond you back. To be honest, I don't know. Okay. Uh, the one more question from uh, Dr. Harini, Assistant Professor, Department of Biochemistry. Uh, what are the new research trends in medical electronics, particularly COVID-19? So, uh, I, you know, originally I had, uh, thanks for the question. Originally I had a uh, um, lot of discussion points and a lot of uh, material around the um, medical device that is specifically for um, responding towards COVID-19 situation, right? Um, so there is two major devices that is used in this situation is uh, the ventilator and the pulse oximeter. Uh, for the time and uh, to reduce the content, I removed the entire ventilator aspect. Uh, ventilator is one uh, important instrument that is used in the treatment of COVID-19 because uh, the way this virus attacks is it attacks the lungs and reduces the lung capacity. So when you lose your lung capacity, you cannot um, saturate enough blood in oxygen. So, so that means now we need assistance from outside because you cannot naturally aspirate. You need help in you know, like um, um, breathing. So ventilator is the device. Uh, and this ventilator is being around uh, since probably 1860s, the oldest uh, uh, ventilator is like a, um, you know, people put, you know, the person who is sick inside a box and they create a, um, a mechanical ventilation by creating a negative pressure in the box and releasing it. So that, you know, that presses and relieves the chest. So it is almost like, um, uh, creating a manual resist, um, manual resi respiration. Then it got improved on, and now we are at a mode where you know uh, uh, our electromechanical ventilation is good enough uh, and smart enough to identify what patient is doing, what is their respiration cycle, what is the tidal volume, and how to adjust the oxygen flow. Everything it can smartly identify and do it. So that's why those ventilators are very costly, you know. Um, and th within this last eight, nine months, there is so many uh, researchers, scientists, students, uh, and um, many, many organizations stepped up and took the basic concept of um, positive air pressure ventilation and um, um, with various assisting modes, um, they came up with um, the traditional mechanical ventilation in a small form factor. For example, companies like Mahendra or um, Dyson or um, um, GM, you know, started producing these, uh, um, um, it used to be called like a portable or manual resuscitator. Um, it's, it's like an ambulatory bag. Um, so they, they tried to, you know, like uh, come up with a quick, cheap ventilators 
you know, for to cater the need, the mass need for COVID-19. Uh, other than ventilator and the pulse oximeter, I don't know uh, any other specific device, unless otherwise you have an underlying condition like a kidney issue or a diabetes, you know, then, you know, like our liver function issues, you know, then you might need a different um, devices. But these are all the two major devices that I know. The third one is uh, on the diagnostic side where um, the CPR test and the, you know, like um, the protein test, you know, like creating those uh, lab tests, right? Um, um, there is a lot of um, existing devices recalibrated and new reagents are created um, to analyze um, to analyze the, you know, um, the samples collected and to find out, you know, whether somebody is infected with COVID or not. So there is a lot of developments going on on the diagnostic side of it, but on the treatment side, um, to my knowledge, mostly the ventilators and the pulsatometers are the ones heavily used. Did I answer your question? Okay. And, uh... Yes, yes. Uh, one more question from uh, Dr. Ramya from Department of Chemistry of our college. Uh, what are the challenges for biomedical device and circuit design? So uh, today, you know, like uh, if you take implantable, you know, oh, the key is the biocompatibility, right? You know, so we touched upon very uh, lightly, you know, like uh, when you embed something, you need to encapsulate into, you know, biocompatible material. So that is one thing uh, that is, uh, there is a lot of research happening in that area to make, you know, um, uh, many biocompatible plastics and polymers that can, you know, make these devices embeddable. Uh, outside of that, you know, um, if, if a device is outside, um, making a reliable circuitry, you know, for example, uh, creating the circuits that cannot corrode, you know, in uh, abusive situations, making a device that is uh, more um, sensible to um, if in a wet conditions. Um, those are all other challenges, which we have proven technology, how to coat uh, uh, yeah, electronic circuit, you know, um, you know, most of these devices are, you know, gold plated, so it doesn't corrode and um, coated with um, um, the um, uh, moisture resistant barriers, so that, you know, it is good. Um, the, the other biggest uh, problem that we face is the, uh, the battery capacity you know, creating a reliable power source. If we had unlimited battery capacity, we will have a lot of devices, life-saving devices that people can put, uh, you know, carry in their bodies and uh, they can live longer. Today, uh, because that is not available, you know, we are keeping them inside a hospital and, uh, you know, typically we call it as life support systems or critical care systems where they are tethered to a device where they are not movable. Um, so those, those are all the, some of the challenges that comes top of uh, my mind, um, but I'm, I'm sure there is more. Okay, uh, any more questions? Dr. Prakash? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I'm audible, sir. Audible, sir. Can I ask a question, sir? Yes, yes, yes. You can, you can raise your question. Yes, sir. Uh, I found that uh, this presentation is too good. Uh, the speaker uh, covered uh, almost all the medic biomedical devices, particularly VA sensors. But uh, I have a question to the speaker. How, I mean, the cost wise, uh, VA sensors are uh, how. Uh, costly or is it affordable for the third world countries like that only I wish to know. So, uh, but thanks a lot for the question. It's a very good question. So I intentionally, you know, uh, did not include cost in the commercial viability um, because I didn't want to change the, you know, student population thinking about cost while researching. So the, the key component here is, you know, when we make in a large scale, the cost goes down dramatically. 
Um, but today, um, because of um, the cost spent on the research and the you know, and the devices and, and the, the technology to make these devices uh, is so costly because we are doing it in small scale, uh, it is definitely cost prohibitive in a third world country and also um, our developing countries for that matter. And also these devices is not self-contained. So if you look at you know, some of the older medical devices, it is self-contained. That means you know, it does one function, it, uh, it doesn't need a connectivity, it doesn't need to talk to another device, it doesn't need a maintenance. But a lot of the new sensors, you know, including the wave sensor family, uh, it needs other sensors, other devices, and other processes sitting outside. So even though you have a sensor, sensor itself may not be coffee, but the associated systems around it, you know, the the, the digital electro, uh, the um, digital technologies, the software, and the processing systems goes around it um, becomes very costly due to you know various um, commercial factors like patents, you know, uh, the exclusivities, and you know, uh, the, the, the commercial companies try to make. Uh, within themselves and to create those monopolies, the cost becomes high. Uh, but if, if a technology is adopted uh, and um, bringing down cost is just a matter of time and a um, uh, matter of adoption. So the more we adopt, the cost will be nothing. Thanks, sir. Thanks for your answer, sir. I'm uh, happy with that answer. Uh, I also you. appreciate uh, appreciate you for uh, covering all the biomedical devices in this present in this presentation, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, due to time consuming, we conclude this session. I, on behalf of management and uh, my personal thanks to Mr. Vail Murugan for this wonderful uh, session. And thanks a lot. Special thanks to Dr. Uh, Dr. Prakash. Uh, Assistant Professor, Center for Nanoscience and Nanotechnology University of Metas for attending this session. Uh, the next session starts at 11.30 a.m. Now over to Dr. L. Parimala, ma'am. If you want to say anything, please, ma'am. Thank you so much, sir, for accepting our invitation uh, within short span of time.